Hi everyone, my name is Joe Webster. I, uh, I'm part of the FGNA social media team. I'm here interviewing Kathy James for this month's um, segment, which is on martial arts and Feldenkrais. Um, Kathy um, is, uh, I'm, we're privileged to have Kathy. She's actually just finished a training segment um, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about her experience with Aikido, with Feldenkrais, and how she um, combines the two and uh, how she uses them in her daily life and practice. Um, so welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Joe. Nice to be here. I'm, I'm pleased to have you on. I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about this subject as well. Um, can we start off uh, just briefly, uh, just for me to ask you a little bit about how you first encountered Aikido? Yeah, um, I was in college and mm -hmm. um, of course studying something very contrary, not contrary, but biology, zoology, and kind of going to higher education. <laughs> and um, at the school I was going to, they, they offered this one week uh, of like alternative programming which was really off the wall. This is like in the 70s, 1970s. So um, I was lucky enough to find the time to go to these two kind of workshops or two classes. One was called Aikido and it was a presentation by George Leonard who is a author, um, pretty well known author in the United States. And uh, he was this elegant, tall, tall man with white hair and here I am a student in college and, um, and he was moving, doing these beautiful movements with this person trying to attack him and strike him. And he was just moving elegantly off the line as we say in Aikido. And, um, and I was looking at this and thinking, you know, I had been a dancer and movement person. And as I was getting older, there was all these stories in my head that came up about, you can't dance anymore because you're getting old. And I saw this man and I thought, oh, wow, this is something I could do when I get older. That's, mm. that's exciting. Mm. So that was my first introduction to Aikido, which took me several years to find it again. But at the same time, the other class that I took, serendipitously, whatever, was Feldenkrais. And um, uh, Will Schutz was there, uh, who was the author of Joy, and who was down at Esalen with M Moshe. And so he was doing a demonstration of awareness through movement. Okay, and, and that was at the same time. Same time, exact yeah. same time, yeah. So I, it was like in this classroom, you know, with chairs and they had moved them to the side. It was a real classroom. And there were people, like I had to stand out the door because it was so full, right? And he's doing the, you know, the basic rotation movement, right? Where we turn our head opposite and and I was doing this movement and kind of going, yeah, okay, this is kind of interesting, but kind of simple, simple, simple. And then at the end, you know, my range of movement increased so much that I just kind of was shocked. How could something like moving my arm, my head in these opposite directions produce this different action through my whole self? Mm. So that caught my attention and I was kind of cur curious. Again, not to refine it for several years, but I had a few people at the university I was going to that had actually been doing kind of, I would say on the side Feldenkrais, they didn't really know it yet because this is still mid seventies kind of, so to speak. So Moshe had just been to Esalen more or less. Mm -hmm. So, um, so they, whatever they got from him, they were trying to use and invent and understand as, as we students try to do, right? Yeah, it's not it's not like nowadays where there's like a whole internet and you know yeah. all DV, uh, you know like MP3s to download and stuff like that. Yeah, you can go Zoom now. Any class in Australia, exactly. England, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which is what Moshe actually I think had intended. So, mm. but yeah, I mean, it must have been it must have had a sort of mystical quality, you know, back then where it was very much like word of mouth. Yeah, it, it was, you knew, you knew. Yeah, it was totally that way. And I remember after that experience with Will Schutz, I got awareness through movement. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe probably not right after that, but somewhere after that, I got that and I started reading it again. 
And um, it just, it just made so much more sense to me than sitting in a classroom studying from books. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe it's just my predisposition to want to move. <laughs> and, and when I read the, you know, the idea of learning through movement, it just really resonated with me more like, oh, my experiences and how I move and how I engage with my movement is more than just like something to do. It's, it's something to be, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so that just caught my attention. But like I said, I, I ended up graduating finally from college and then dropped all that stuff and went down and studied ballet and uh, dance and moved all around doing some of that. And like I said, eventually realized I was getting old mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and I was happened to be in the, uh, the Bay Area at the time in San Francisco, well, outside in the Palo Alto area. And that's where I heard about Moshe putting on the Amherst training. Mm. So okay. I applied, yeah. So since that time, have you been doing Aikido and Feldenkrais concurrently all the time since then? Yeah, so I, I did, I, I pretty much did Feldenkrais and Aikido in the very beginning, like 1980, all the time, 1979, 78, I did Aikido and then I blended in the Feldenkrais work and, and then I took a hiatus. I left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and some of that was just, you know, not having this, the, the, uh, the self image, I think maybe that I could do the work, mm -hmm. felt the Feldenkrais work. Like I remember watching Moshe and being kind of stunned by what he would do and how he would work with children and adults. And, and I remember being around my peers and everyone saying, oh, look, look, you see, you see. And I'm going, oh, I don't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, it's quite a high standard, I can imagine. It's quite yeah, high yeah. yeah. And so in back then, no one really heard about it that much, not that we were that well known now, but still back then in 1980, it was kind of elusive. And um, so I needed to have a job that I could depend on. And, and uh, so I did that for about four years. And then I just decided I didn't want to be in that world anymore, business and marketing and all those corporations. And yeah. I, I kind of left and I uh, was lucky enough to be in the Bay Area where there were people that I could reconnect with and work with and kind of... Uh, and, you know, it's kind of like riding a bicycle. I know everyone is in a training program is a little concerned about, oh, what if we don't work? I would say it's like a bicycle. You just get back on it. Mm. You'll, you'll remember. It'll touch you. And it'll never leave you, I don't think. It's I hope so. Yeah, yeah, it's part of our experience. In, um, for me, more recently, and you were just talking about your training segment that you're on and how they've just come back into training after yeah. taking a break during COVID. And we had the same thing on my training, just yeah. towards the end of it, um, we had the same thing. So there was definitely a moment where it's like you, like you lose the connection with the people that you were training with. And, you know, it's like, how do you kind of keep that up? So I, I definitely understand that, that element. Yeah, and, and we did a, in this group that I'm with right now, they just, they're starting their third year mm -hmm. before we had the two year break. And, um, and what was really great to see is kind of like that idea, you don't lose it. They were, we, we had them get into small groups and talk about or come up with some ideas how they might work with something. And mm -hmm. I was so amazed at what they came up with. Mm -hmm. It's like they, they may not, we may not have been engaged like in person together, but they were engaged with the work. I don't think it leaves us. Yeah, I think there's something about it not being superficial. You know, yeah. it's like it goes right down to the core, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It yeah. does. Yeah. So I'm going to, um, so you've given us a little bit about, you know, how you first engaged with Feldenkrais and uh, Aikido. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, to kind of question you on both a little and understand how one has affected the other. Yes. Um, so with your Aikido practice, how has being involved in Feldenkrais um, improved it or changed your Aikido practice. And then after that, we'll move on and do the opposite. Okay, yeah. So in Aikido, um, uh, 
you know, people, people are, are there. Well, there's the person who's the thrower and we call, we'll call them the nage, the person who throws. And then there's the person who comes and attacks, right? And, um, and each role is, is really kind of potent in a way. Um, I remember when I first started Aikido to attack was really scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and I remember then uh, besides that was like after being attacked and then being attacked was also scary. So being having to hit somebody or pretend to do that, it's kind of a mutual agreement that we make mm -hmm. was frightening because I didn't think that was part, you know, that doesn't feel like me. No. Or it does maybe a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> you have to like get into it. Yeah, you get into it actually. Yeah. And um, but what what I find is that is that because uh, with Aikido, there's a real demand for attention. Mm -hmm. There's a real demand for a kind of uh, listening that's not verbal. Yeah. So it, it's more movement structured. There's a sensitivity that's required for how to coordinate with someone else. Yeah. Um, and there's a conflict. Usually, I mean, their their job is to present me or the or whoever, like I'm supposed to create a conflict, something that you I have to not so much react to. Of course, that's what we do first when we're learning. There's a reaction. Mm -hmm. And you can see that's the fight flight mechanisms, right? Yeah. So yeah. somebody comes, I either go ah or I move, right? Or I run or something. And so this way of working in Aikido. I mean, I think how Feldenkrais helped me so much in Aikido was to be able to kind of listen to my, my, the sensations inside myself mm -hmm. and to realize that um, there's a way of shifting my attention internally because as soon as someone attacks you, usually the energy rises. Yeah. And uh, through doing awareness, through movement, you start to learn a little bit. Of course, Aikido is teaching this at the same time. So they're both doing, I mean, they're both doing a similar kind of thing in a different kind of way. Yeah. And so the, the Feldenkrais really helped me like more and more become sensitive to how to move, how to stay a little bit more grounded and connected. Mm -hmm. But as the years have progressed, I would say what I love about Aikido is the feeling of uh, training like um, a kinematic linkage. I can use that those that language. Please do, but please explain it. <laughs> yeah. So so like someone will grab me, like let's say a wrist grab, and of course they have a a wrist or a hand, a wrist, an elbow, a shoulder. It crosses through the chest to the hips to the foot. Yeah. yeah. Of course, if they're if they're grabbing me, then I can just move their energy up through that line of force. So I'm taking their line of force, which is coming in with a grab or could be a strike, anything, but I'm redirecting their, their movement yeah. back through their skeleton. Mm. And, and, and in a way that in what I'm doing is I'm disturbing their balance and joining with them. We call it a blending, mm -hmm. right? a blending of the two systems. And in yeah. some ways, Aikido is this way of harmony, right? We're not looking... I mean, I'm looking to take care of my attacker. Yeah. I'm, you know, and we throw and, but it's, whoops, did I just lose you? No, you're okay. You're okay. okay. Yeah, okay. it cut out a little bit, but I was getting your voice. That's so fine. Okay. Yeah, something happened on my, on my thing. Hold on a sec. Uh, okay, there you are. Um, I forgot where I was. Uh, you were talking about the joining process. Oh yeah, so there's that joining, and and because I I love uh, working through the skeleton, that really and Feldenkrais is so I mean so potent in that way to actually feel how to send force through a skeleton with someone lying down. So it's it's really very interesting to do it when someone's trying to grab you or push you or hold your arms behind your back or strike you with a sword of how to redirect the forces back to their skeleton. And I would just say as the receiver, sometimes if someone like a really high sensei, you know, I have my favorite senseis, um, it actually feels healing mm. when you get thrown really, really well. Mm, it feels like, yeah. 
Yeah. It, it's a clean throw. There's no torquing through the system. It's right through every joint. And there's no doubt in my mind that I'm going to fall. I mean, I have no choice. Yeah. Yeah. No second guessing there. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I have a follow up question. Um, and you mentioned a little bit about um, fear in relation to martial arts. Yes. And I think that fear was a big part of what Moshe was kind of exploring especially in his early books, um, but also later on as well. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think the, you know, so in martial arts specifically, you're kind of coming into contact with that. Yes. Um, but within Aikido, there's, a, there's an emphasis on the process of falling. Yes. Um, and how falling, I guess, is some way of navigating that, fear that we all have I don't know if you can say anything more about that yeah so so for sure it when you start Aikido like the first times you come into a class um, you'll be guided in particular ways every dojo is a little different that's the mm -hmm. place where we train um, you'll be guided differently like how to fall you want to learn how to uh, take care of yourself through rolling and being able to do a forward roll, a backward roll. And, um, and that is a, a process of, uh, of getting comfortable <laughs> with going down <laughs> and, yeah. and letting your feet be taken by the person throwing you. It can be in the beginning, I think depends on when you start it can have a, a, a fear component. I think because I was young when I started more or less and I was already a dancer and kind of coming into this world thinking I knew what I was doing, but I didn't. <laughs> I, it wasn't so fearful for me to fall. I, I liked it. But mm -hmm. I know when I work with people around falling, um, the element of, of how to uh, really soften enough and allow the head and the chest to take those forces because a common injury and the Aikido world is, of course, a broken clavicle or dislocated mm. shoulder, not to mention neck and head injuries, but, but they can be strong. So, you know, there is a, I think, a tendency as Uke, the person attacking, as when they're new, they kind of stiffen when they begin to fall. But through the process of practice and training mm. uh, and, and, and really developing Again, I think, you know, in Aikido, at least the way my dojo works, there's a kind of a mutual consensus. We're really not going to hurt each other, right? Yeah. So as a, as a practitioner of Aikido, I can feel when someone's having a challenge falling, yeah. and then I can soften my throw and yeah. allow the person to set up so that they are safe. So they've got more time. They've got more time. And if you give them that time and they keep practicing in that safe way, like we try to create in Feldenkrais, then the learning begins to develop mm -hmm. and they get more comfortable, right? And, and you know, and there's, there's like, you know, workshops that go on in the Aikido world of soft ukemi and high yeah. falls and backward rolls and how to do these kinds of things, break falls. So, there, you know, you can go and get really, really, good at all of it yeah uh, it's on my list of things to do actually be high flying right it's really <laughs> fun to be a person who can fall high into the air yeah. and land like, softly on the mat it's um it's not so much a part of the tai chi world falling over no <laughs> no it's not a part of the tai chi world i've done a teeny bit yeah yeah, yeah. um so what would you say is the importance of kind of exploring that fear of falling or um, developing how you relate to the floor for a general audience that isn't interested in martial arts? Like, yeah. is, there, is there some reason why someone that isn't interested in martial arts would want to practice falling? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the, the challenge of, of um, falling is, is the fear. And usually where people start worrying about falling is when they're 65. 
and maybe they've never done anything like this before. And, um, and that's where I, I, you know, I have a clients that are in those age brackets where they, they are definitely falling and yeah. how to work with them. And, um, and I would say, you know, I would say we need to do it sooner. <laughs> I would, I would think, I think learning to fall, uh, I mean, I think learning to do a martial, I mean, any kind of movement uh, mm -hmm. could possibly incorporate the ideas of how to fall safely, right? To a mat, how to roll. I mean, mm -hmm. there've been stories about people who got in car accidents or motorcycle accidents and they had a background in martial arts and the way that they landed. In, <laughs> at that point at the training level, when you train the body will tuck and you'll fall in a way that's more protective. But just as Feldenkrais found out, you know, you can't train this in two months. Mm -hmm. You can't train someone to do a martial arts in two months and then somebody comes and attack you and be able to survive. It's not, right. it's not embodied yet. It's not part of the fabric of your intelligent movement kind of, or, or that fight flight kind of system. Mm -hmm. So you really, I mean, you know, ideally it would be let's just introduce it all along the way, refresh it at 20, 30, 40, 50. And then as we get to 60s, 70s, everyone's more comfortable with being able to soften and roll, right? Yeah. And I think one of the first things Feldman Christ taught a lot when it was rolling in judo, from judo, right? Yeah. He was trying to help people learn how to do a forward roll uh, that were in their, you know, maybe 40s or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I think it has value because um, getting comfortable with gravity in this kind of way, because mm -hmm. uh, we are going to be pulled down. I've fallen a few times and a hundred people have, every once in a while say, did you hurt yourself? I said, no, I didn't. And I'm, 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 I'm grateful and glad, but I think the way I fell was a soft fall and I didn't knock on wood, break anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it, I think there's a, a way in which if we could train it or experience it more often, we can overcome that fear and, and then get more comfortable. And, and of course, there's a whole set of other things that are gonna emerge out of that, not just the ability to fall. Mm, yeah. So one of the, the thoughts I have as you're talking about that is um, like the relevance of softness in relation to martial arts and there are obviously lots of martial arts in the world and some of them uh, head more in the direction of softness and some head more in the direction of hardness. Yes. In your experience, what is the benefit of working in a soft way in, in a martial art? Yeah, well, not having worked really in the hard way, I'm not sure I'm qualified to say. Okay. Um, but I will say that about the soft side of the art, and even Aikido, I've trained with a lot of different teachers, yeah. um, like just a few. I've trained with some really pretty physical Aikidoist, yeah. and, um, and, that, and that's great training. It, there's something, I think, develop, even developmentally, when I think of O oh Sensei, the founder of Aikido, mm -hmm. and if you look at his trajectory, um, he was very uh, physical early on in his training. He did a lot of physical hard training. Yeah. And I, I think in general, there's like a, a, a pathway to get to that soft internal experience mm -hmm. where I, I can use, like we develop the muscle power to throw. Yeah. And, and then over time, you start to refine that into this other thing that's more internal. Mm. And it becomes more like, like in the mus muscle way of throwing, which I've experienced, and I actually, have, I you know, still catch myself doing. Um, it's not like it's hard or bad or anything. It's different. I actually feel the other person more. Mm -hmm. And there's something that happens as, as I feel like the lineage progresses as we get older. And I train with some of my teachers that were younger now that are older. Like they're softer, they still have the power, but I, it's like, they surprise me that they throw me because I don't feel them entering into my system like that. Because right. as soon as you feel that, that effort of someone coming in to throw you, I could resist it. 
Yeah. Right. But when someone sneaks the thread in like that, that <laughs> connection, you can't feel it, but they've upset your balance. Yeah. And then pretty much you're gone unless you really yeah. figure out how to regain it. And of course, I'm talking about a slow practice at the moment, but it's very interesting to take that, take that time to feel like, I go, oh, you have me, but I can't fight that. Mm, yeah. And it's because it, uh, it would take a muscle reaction to fight it. And then yeah, they've got yeah. you even more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm not sure I answered your question exactly. <laughs> well, I have a follow up um, in relation to functional integration, um, because you talked then a little bit about the um, the the sensing into someone else and the effectiveness of that and for many people i would imagine that watch these kind of videos on youtube or however they access it they might not really understand what functional integration is yeah um, so i i would i would be grateful if you would take a, a few minutes just to maybe explain it um in a way that helps it helps people make sense of it i guess yeah um so so it can be you know it can be a lot of different things obviously but um like when a person let's say a person comes to see me right who has like maybe an injury or an accident they've had um not i also work with people who want to perform better in certain activities but, but let's just say the standard of you know people come to us for uh injuries and pain and discomfort and, and as, I, as I observe and listen to their story, so to speak, you can kind of start to see like there's a, a thread of overuse. Maybe they, they've been gardening and they've been using their arm a lot and pulling on the weeds and something pretty basic, right? Uh, nothing, I mean, usually people hurt themselves in the mundane things that we do in life and not when we go to the gym and work out and do all these great things. Mm -hmm. the, putting the dishes away or mm -hmm. tripping or something like that. So, so, um, so I, I look at how they use themselves, right? So the key thing yeah. here is, is, is how does a person do what they do and how do they uh, understand how they're doing it? And most often we can do a lot of movements unconsciously, thank goodness. We don't have to think about it. But I want to help the person start to to sense how they're doing it mm. and, and feel um, that perhaps their way of moving is connected to their painful situation in their shoulder, right? Yeah. And so in functional integration then, first I wanna see what they do because I can't know how to help them until or how to construct something until I see how they move. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then from there, then we can work on the table and oftentimes if i'm thinking if it's a you know a, a arm shoulder problem you know the hands are connected to everything we do um and of course from a martial perspective i'll never be strong enough to throw anyone with my arms so so the linkage i have to be able to realize that when i go to pull a weed it's not my shoulder doing it but it's my pelvis mm -hmm. right there's a movement that's going to come from the, somewhere between the, the, sh the hand and the pelvic region, hip joints. We can go into all those areas where the big powerful muscles. But again, most of us think of ourselves as parts, mm. right? So it's my arm doing the movement and, I, and most modalities, most movement is kind of parts doing something and strengthening my like most people say, well, I'm just not strong enough and my bicep is too weak or my deltoids or my, I'm just not flexible enough in this region. And I would say, yeah, that's true. <laughs> if you think that way, it is that way. Mm -hmm. But if you can feel how to connect to your pelvis, then it's not a matter of a, a area, an address getting stronger. It's more a matter of the whole self moving connected to your intention to grab on that, that weed and pull it out, right? So yeah. in functional integration, more or less, I would um, start to construct some kind of basic movement pattern that would help them to start to feel how their pelvis was actually yeah. connected to their hand. 
right? Is that? Yeah, so I, I mean, it, it, it sends me in the direction of um, what we were talking about in terms of martial arts and touch and sensing and how in some way you're, you know, you're, you're listening to the weak part of the opponent in a way to disturb their balance, you know, or something like that. It's like, you know, you, you're using your attention, you're using your own awareness of yourself right. in some way to interact with yeah. the, with yeah. the opponent. And yeah. it, it strikes me that the way that you're describing uh, functional integration is kind of the same thing, um, but it's just using your self-awareness to guide the person's self-awareness to the pattern or to the habit. Yeah, so so that's where that, you know, how to send a force through from the skeleton through to the hand or the hand connecting into the pelvis. So they start to feel that relationship and that it's not, it's not necessarily the all muscle work at that point, mm. but it's this synergistic kind of the skeleton, the fascia, the muscle, the intention, the motivation to have a beautiful yard. All of that is is present, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then and then I'll add a little water to the ground, and then the weed comes out very easy. <laughs> <laughs> Now add, add the pelvis to the picture and it comes out easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The pelvis is the water, right? The pelvis is the but, water, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay. Um, In so, California, where it's so dry, we always wait for the rain to come before we pull the weeds. <laughs> I see. Uh, I used to be a gardener um, back in a previous life. And uh, one of the, the great uh, descriptions I heard was that... Um, the the if you look in the dictionary a weed the definition of it is basically a plant that's in the wrong place ah. um, so there aren't actually really any weeds <laughs> just in the wrong place <laughs> just in the wrong place yeah yeah um, which maybe is like there aren't any problem we don't actually have any problems or that's right that's right yeah yeah if there is that um, yeah <laughs> um so one more question um i don't know you probably need to go soon um but one more question just about um the development of kind of power um in relation to martial arts um people tend to think that um feldenkrais because it's a sort of slow movement practice that it doesn't necessarily lend itself to a fast effective movement practice um aikido obviously can be a fast effective movement practice i've seen it i'm sure you've experienced it um could you say a little bit about how feldenkrais could be relevant um you know for helping you develop that kind of power yeah so so again i think it's it's important to like think about what what do we mean by power right because mm. that's a, a different different idea for many people Right. And, um, and like in my training of um, Aikido, power is, is, is more capacity to act, uh, not so much a, a, capacity, a capacity to do something to someone or okay. to put someone in place, but a, a, a capacity to act with the intention um, to take care of the situation, right, in a okay. safe way. I like that. Way. Yeah. So, so from that perspective, if I, if, but that does require, so power is kind of like, um, you know, Feldenkrais would say, people would ask him, well, why don't you um, teach us how to be more, have more chi or ki? And he would kind of laugh and say, well, that's what I'm doing. Mm. I just don't call it that, right? Yeah, yeah. Because again, there's these words that we grow up in, like, you know, posture is this really funny word mm. that has so many different meanings and you never know how someone relates to it. And then there's, you know, chi and ki, because I grew up in that and they have like, ooh, that must be mystical, magical. You've got to work for 20, 30 years to get that kind of, you know, to get the chi or the ki going, flowing. 
The yeah. government doesn't say no, it's an organization. So I see power is the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's an organization of the self mm -hmm. to um, connect to my intention, but not to do harm. Mm. Right. So that, like I said, when, when my, one of my favorite teachers throws me, I always feel like I'm lucky. I mm. always feel like, oh my God, that was the best feeling ever. <laughs> it was the best FI, functional integration ever, <laughs> right? And, um, and that's because he was listening in such a way that did no harm internally to my body, mm. right? Because, you know, you can be, a lot of martial arts do meet force with force. Yeah. But, but Aikido is really about taking that force and then bringing it back to the person through them. And I think if we can be skillful enough, we can redirect that organization through the person. And so for me, that's where, where it's not a power of muscle, but it's a power of my intention, um, my awareness, mm -hmm. how I use my attention, how I sense the other person. Because if it's a, a person above my rank, or even a bigger person, mm -hmm. you know, I have to be way more skillful. If it's a beginner, I have to shift, I have to tone down mm -hmm. right? so that they can get organized quickly enough. Because it's usually kind of like in the beginning, we're all pretty army with movement. Yeah. I want to throw you with my arms. Yeah. And I'm going to keep my feet stuck in one spot and not move and overreach. But uh, so you have to pay it, you know, each person brings there. And so my, the skill of power is, I think, how we organize the center. Yeah. And Aikido, you know, we, we have, I think it's the movement practices that are part of the, um, of the partner practice that develops the hara, right? And, and it's not like we do these exercises, like, but I think Feldenkrais then is really good at really specifically bringing in these practices that help you feel in a slow kind of way how to develop that linkage and that sense of power from the pelvic bowl through the spine to the arms. And there's so many awareness through movement lessons that do that. Mm -hmm. And I think had I not done Feldenkrais and Aikido at the same time, I might be probably not training anymore because it's mm -hmm. kind of, it can hurt. Yeah. <laughs> but if you know how to use power and how to take a fall, it doesn't have to, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it, I think Feldenkrais definitely, from my experience, I'm so grateful that I, I did them together. It, mm -hmm. it just really feels like it's a, a good match. Yeah. Good thing to do at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's great. I don't think I would um, ask any more of you from the, <laughs> that, that last description. I think you captured what we were trying to get to with uh, functional integration in there as well, you know? Okay, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, well, I think that's um, uh, everything for today. Okay. Um, thank you to Kathy for um, joining us. Um, thank you, Joe and the Guild. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, um, can people reach you via your website? What's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Yeah, so I do have a website. You want me just to say what it is? Please, yeah, please. Okay, it would be www.kjamesfeldenkrais.com. And where are you based? I'm based in uh, Petaluma, California, Northern California, Sonoma County. And do you have any online lessons that people could access? Uh, I have a few, but not a lot. Okay. Um, but uh, that's to be developed. Yeah. Uh, to develop, now that so much is online and there's so much, so many recordings, I'm yeah. looking at setting up a library. Great. Well, I, I look forward to taking part. Um, I thank you for um, taking part in this interview, um, and I hope to speak to you again at some point. Yeah, it would be nice. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I enjoy